You're watching Kenny on Sunday on Sky News Live. Well, let's waste no time now and go to our special guest, Jordan Peterson. He is the runaway success author, psychologist, academic, public speaker, who's telling us all a little bit about ourselves and urging us to look within ourselves to make life for us and others better through his 12 rules for life. He joins me live from Toronto, Canada now. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Jordan Peterson. Really great to have your company. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. Look, I don't expect you to be uh, fully au fait with the uh, latest political upheaval in Australia. God knows many Australians are still just trying to catch up with it. But we've seen enormous political volatility in a lot of Western liberal democracies of late. And I just wonder whether you can tell us, you see any connection, any lessons from this political volatility? Is there any sense that it might stem from a weakening in our community standards or personal standards? Well, it seems like there's increasing polarisation and political views all across the West, and it isn't obvious why that's happening. Uh, I have some suspicion that it might be a consequence of the transformations in the media landscape as the older media types are more and more desperate for attention and perhaps attending more to polarising views. But, it's, but it might be something deeper than that as well. I mean, there is some indication, I guess, that... In the West, we're having a crisis with regards to our fundamental values and, and that that's, that's driving a certain amount of unease about our ethical position in the world, let's say. Yeah, that's an interesting paradox because if you look to the USA, just uh, to your south, of course, uh, Donald Trump seems to have tapped into this. And uh, whatever, uh, whatever we think about Donald Trump, we don't tend to think of strong personal values. Yet he seems to have understood at least some sort of a yearning in the public mind. Well, I, I think that um, the, the West has been under a sustained crit criticism from, generated from itself for, for, for a very long time, for a number of generations now. And... Um, Trump has capitalized on that to some degree by attempting to stand for something that approximates traditional values as a bulwark against that intense, mostly intense criticism, mostly generated on the radical left. And so it's a very strange paradox, because if you look around the world uh, globally, things are getting much better financially for most people. Like the world has halved poverty, absolute poverty levels between the year 2000 and the year 2012. Part of that seems to be a delayed consequence of our victory in the Cold War and the spread of free market economy ideas and private property and economic freedom ideals all around the world. But at the same time, the West seems to be suffering from a crisis of conscience with regards to its traditional values of individualism, say, and, it, and the role that it plays in the world. So and Trump does seem to have tapped into that to some degree. Yeah, I want to come back to that uh, broader issue, but in your book, uh, your runaway success book, 12 Rules for Life, um, and, and I've seen a lot of your, your lectures and debates uh, on, on YouTube as well, um, uh, a lot of what you say is that we should look to ourselves, look to get, get our own personal house in order, uh, lest uh, th then we can first uh, contribute more uh, to those around us. Uh, yet in this modern age, it seems there's a propensity for so many of us to blame our own shortcomings on others, to portray ourselves as victims and, uh, and, uh, and blame our shortcomings on others. Is this a, is, is this a natural tendency that's uh, always been in play or is this part of some sort of modern malaise? Well, I think it's, a, it's an age-old tendency to some degree because it's always easier in some sense to blame the problems that you might have in your life on some identifiable external source. It means that you don't bear responsibility for them and that you have a valid target for your anger. And that can be very, uh, that can be very welcome if you're feeling frustrated and angry about your situation in life. What I've been trying to do in my lectures and on tour is to make the case to people, though, that we all need a sustaining meaning in our lives because life can be very difficult. And Certainly everyone's life is difficult and very difficult at some points and that most of the antidote to that can be found in the adoption of, of heavy responsibility. I mean, most of the people that we admire or even when we admire ourselves, maybe in the brief moments that we do, we admire people who 
take responsibility for themselves and then who have something left over for their family and their community. And my sense is, is that, especially for young people, the idea that community activism is the proper way forward in life has been pushed for, I would say, probably since the mid-60s. And yet most of the meaning that people find in their life and the sustaining meaning is a consequence of the adoption of individual responsibility. And it's also the case that you should practice in a small area in terms of getting things together before you try to set the world in order. It's much, it's much, it's, it, it's good to have the practice to set things right in a small arena before you try operating on a large scale. So I think the, I, th I think in the absence of individual responsibility and the meaning it brings that people get nihilistic and desperate and that's, that's very bad for everyone. Have we lost some of the uh, institutions that help to, to encourage individual reflection and individual responsibility? I'm thinking primarily of the churches, but probably other social institutions. Uh, even though we communicate more easily now than ever before, have we become more self-centred and therefore not able to get those lessons? I mean, it takes a group. It takes some sort of organisation, well, some, so, some, sort of, um, some sort of credo to focus us back on our own personal responsibility. Well, it's a good question. I mean, one of the things that you could say about the role that the church played, regardless of your opinion about religion or about organized religion for that matter, is that at least when people attended church, they spent something approximating an hour or two hours a week contemplating the purpose of their lives and their responsibility to themselves ethically and their responsibility to the broader community and, and maybe to, you know, the, to reality at large, let's say, to God. And that that void that that that, trans, that void in relationship to the transcendent doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to have been filled by anything else and i think that that's produced a certain kind of shallowness and the problem with the shallowness is that because life is difficult as as i mentioned before and, and of course everyone knows that you need a profound meaning to sustain you especially through difficult times and you also need to understand how much potential you have as an individual because that's the sort of thing that fortifies you when you're at your weakest moments or your most vulnerable moments. So parsing off the responsibility to society is not very helpful because it disempowers you and that's, uh, that's, that's very painful in, in, when you're in a crisis. Yeah, it's really pleasing to hear you talk, as you do all the time, about the fact that life is difficult. Uh, and, and let's address that fundamental fact and, and, and deal with it. Uh, 35 years mm. ago in this country, we had a very pat patrician uh, prime minister by the name of uh, Malcolm Fraser, who was remembered to this day for the phrase he dropped out there saying that life wasn't meant to be easy. Now, he was pilloried for that at difficulties of life is to confront them voluntarily. That seems to be a universal cure in some sense, and I think that's because that voluntary confrontation reveals to us our own strength. And I don't think we do a very good job now of teaching that to young people and to let them know that, that life is difficult, and if they're having trouble, it's not because there necessarily is something wrong with them, but because that's the nature of reality itself, but that despite that, they can prevail which is really the fundamental issue. It's a fantastic message you've got. You've got no wonder everybody wants to hear from you. I mean, how could you be more, show more compassion for someone than by encouraging them to discover their own resilience? Uh, all power to you, Jordan Peterson. I do want to just get your thoughts, though, on a couple of more sort of mundane political issues, I suppose. I want to talk to you about climate change and energy policy. 
Uh, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know uh, uh, it's a very... You, you know it's a very contentious policy issue in Australia, and I know in Ontario, Canada, it's played a big role in the change of your uh, provincial government there recently too. It's, to me, it's a very interesting uh, intersection in climate and energy policy because it puts up sort of scientific and rational fact up against uh, economic and political consequences, but they sometimes clash with moral posturing, certainly political posturing, perhaps even mm. moral posturing. How do we pick our way through this mess? Well, that's very difficult. I spent a number of years working for a UN committee on economic development, sustainable economic development, and I had a very hard time picking my way through the ecological literature because so much of our discussion about ecological issues is contaminated by this political polarization. You know, and when I was reading the material produced by environmentalists, with very few exceptions, Bjorn Lomberg in, in Scandinavia being one of them, is that the environmentalists tended to be radically anti-capitalist, and so it was very difficult to dissociate their claims about environmental degradation from their desire to bring the capitalist system to a halt. And so it contaminates the issue terribly. I mean, when I read through the ecological um, literature, my fundamental focus ended up being on oceanic management because I thought the most critical uh, ecological disaster that confronted us was actually a consequence of overfishing and also something that we could do something about, hypothetically, rather than climate change per se. And I know that Bjorn Lomberg, who's put together teams of economists trying to rank order the world's problems, has determined that money would be best spent in, in improving uh, the lives of infants and, and the health of infants, that's where you get the most return for the dollar. The problem is it's very difficult for us to have discussions about the best way forward without everything becoming contaminated by this underlying polarizing battle between the radical leftists, say, and, and, and the more traditional uh, what, what you, upholders of, of Western individualism and culture. So it's, it's a terrible mess to, to pick our way through. Well, just segueing on I mean, from that... a lot that, of yeah. things are improving. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. Um, look, just segueing on from that, and that'd probably lead on to the, that, that point you're about to make, and that is you've been at the forefront, really, of this battle against the uh, ideological uh, monoculture developing in, in universities in, in Western liberal democracies. Uh, uh, and uh, you would have heard, of course, about the Australian National University here rejecting a well-funded proposal to have a uh, centre for the study of Western civilization. Now, they would never knock back a, a centre yep. for Islamic uh, studies or Asian studies. In fact, they have both those centres. Why is it that in a Western civilization now, well, sure, the very essence of what we've developed in the West really is uh, the fact that we should be free to be self-critical. Of course we should be self-critical. But why are we self-critical to that extent, where we won't even celebrate our own civilization? Uh, are, are we racked by guilt well, for our success? That, well, that's, that's a really good question. Well, I think it is partly a consequence of that proclivity for self-criticism that's, that's developed to an intense degree in the West. But I also think it's a consequence of the uh, incautious subsidization of radical viewpoints for the last 50 years. You know, and we've had a, a critique of, of Western culture generated by the radical leftists since the time of Marx, an incredibly discredited perspective, as far as I'm con concerned, that's resulted in the suffering and deaths of at least 100 million people in the last century. But constant drum banging for the validity of the Marxist critic, uh, critique of Western hierarchies and, and an, an, an uh, insistence, certainly generated in large part by the radical disciplines in the university, that Western culture is nothing but a corrupt patriarchy, and that anyone who has any ambition, young men and women included, uh, is, is essentially acting out the role of junior tyrant. And I think it's an appalling, uh, it's an appalling doctrine, and I think, it's fun I think it's fundamentally misguided with regards to helping the dispossessed as well, because what we're seeing around the world is an absolute miracle in terms of economic development now that the communist countries have been defeated and there isn't so much um, pressure on developing countries to produce socialist economies or communist economies. We're seeing unbelievable wealth being generated all around the world. And so I do think it's a you You made reference to the university situation there in Australia and the refusal to fund the, yep. the Center for the Study of Western Civilization. And I think that's absolutely typical. 
We got some things truly right in the West. The emphasis on individual rights and responsibilities, mostly on responsibility. The emphasis on private property and free markets and, and free trade and all of that. That's the way out of poverty for, for the masses of people in the world. And we've seen that demonstrated unequivocally over the last 15 years. We've halved the rate of ab absolute poverty in the world in the last 15 years. Incredible and that's a consequence of the spread of Western ideas. Absolutely. We should be it proud of it. It is an incredible not, achievement. It, 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 we should be proud of it, not ashamed of it. We're almost completely out of time. God, I'd love to have a beer with you for a few hours next time you're in Australia. But just very quickly, Jordan Peterson, if you can tell us sort of in 25 words or less, I bet you must get people who, individuals whose lives have been changed by your words, by your lectures, by your books. Uh, what does that do to you when you have people coming to you to say that you've basically rescued them with this, this, uh, this uh, insightful advice? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute thrill for me in, at the deepest possible level. This tour that I've been on, which, by the way, is coming back to Australia next February, it, I'm speaking to all these people and they're trying to get their lives together. And, it's absolutely wonderful to see so many people gathered together trying to develop a vision for their lives and trying to straighten themselves out ethically and really attempting to strive forward in an apolitical manner and to transform their lives at a psychological level. It's, it's unbelievably fulfilling and, and I meet hundreds of people a month now um, and speak to thousands about exactly that and, and I can't think of anything that would, that's more that I'd rather be doing that's more meaningful. It's Fantastic. really been something remarkable. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Thanks so much for joining us, Jordan Peterson. Thanks very much for the invitation. Jordan Peterson there, live from Toronto. And as you heard, he'll be back in Australia early next year. You'll be able to go see him speak. Uh, hopefully you'll do a few interviews on programs like this. Man, there's just so much good advice and insightful information there. A pleasure to bring it to you. We're going to have a break now. When we come back, I'm going to speak to the former Federal Liberal Party president, Richard Alston, who's been scathing of Malcolm Turnbull. Why do that now? And where to from here? In 2017, over 400,000 new jobs were created. That's more than 1,100 a day. So if you're a small to medium business owner who's wondering about the next step or has changing business needs, there are government initiatives to help you hire, including financial incentives of up to $10,000 to employ eligible staff. If you're ready to get your business growing, go to jobs.gov.au. Authorised by the Australian Government, Canberra. to beat yesterday with Vivo Active 3 from Garmin. Carpet Call have warehouses like this one all over Australia, stocking the widest range of carpet, timber, laminate, vinyl flooring and rugs. Like this extra wide 9mm laminate starting from just $39.95 per square metre. Or carpet three bedrooms for around $1,200. Australia's widest range of rugs? They're right here. Or you can take a look online. That's why our customers have awarded us the product review four-star rating. And that's why Carpet Call are... The experts in the trade. All right, Trivago, find me a hotel where I can wake up with a view of the ocean. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Trivago. Calibon Steel, inspired by Australia's timeless beauty. Colour Bond, the colours of Australia since 1966. When you're in business, be prepared to hear lots of advice from people who have never had one. It isn't easy. Doing the books, cleaning the floors, even turning up when a spider sets the alarm off at 2am. You will ask yourself if it's all worth it. If you can remember why you started in the first place, well, that's your answer. You stay focused on why you're in business. We'll back you in moments that matter. Now, more than money. It's high time.